and motivation to carry out experiments and this would then be trade uh, trade and tested huge potential in the idea being successful. He had a uh, vast amount of knowledge of radio waves and he understood that radio waves can be used for sending and receive, receiving telegraph messages. He knew that his invention had potential. Um, this thing is Marconi's invention. And now I will talk about how it all began about radio. In 1986, Marconi's first radio was transmitted. As you can see, this picture is this is Marconi's invention things. And the invention was offered to Italian government. And however, the professor was turned down. He migrated to England, where he carried out further experiments on his radio invention. The first radio factory was established in Chelmsford, Essex. A radio link and a radio link between Britain and France was discovered. And after the invention of radio, the first testing system arrives in this country. Uh, I will talk about the example of radi radio use uh, during the World War. Uh, this radio, during the World War, the United States trying to use radio because they know the radio gives the army power army part and they can know the they can know the where the enemy position so they, they can use the radio things. In Hungary Budapest, for example, a subscription service allowed individuals to listen to news reports and fictional story, stories on telephone. Around this time telephones also transmitted Opera performances from Paris to London. And also in 1909, in the United States, the innovation emerged in the United States as a paper play phonograph service in Washington, Delaware. So for the radio beginning, ham operator use whatever frequencies they wish and they can develop that 
for their own technologies, and so they live over here on private sector message, as this can be seen with government message. And these people are the regional descendants uh, in uh, about his history in 1906, Massachusetts resident regional president initiated the first radio transmissions of the human voice. But even his efforts, he cannot develop into a useful application. And he is the leader for it. He, <coughs> after the 10 years from transcendent invention, uh, he used the radio in more modern sense when he set up an exper experimental radio station at 2XG in New York City. He gave nightly broadcast of music and news until World War halted all transmissions for private citizens. Uh, <coughs> and the second part, I'll talk about the evolution of commercial radio uh, and about commercial radio. Uh, this information about most happens in the United States. They have five stations in 1921. So 1923, they have 60, uh, 600 stations, and then 1922, WEAF organization operates toy station, and it is about an ad is the first income producer, producer, however, to avoid the price, but nobody wants to pay a license fee, and in 1927, AT&T. Uh, <clears throat> uh, these companies now very big telephone communication company, and we broadcast simultaneously to WEAF and WNAC in Boston. We create the first network. In 1924, AT&T has 22 stations linked and denies rival IC phone line. Uh, there, in the 19th century, there was an NBC Red and NBC Blue company. And uh, David Sarnoff is the creator of this NBC, NBC company. Uh, this network, as we know it, by that appreciate contracts and it moves the radio from point to point, point to point, to media. <coughs> it creates the programming cost effective, effective paths and news, also makes news national and local. In 1927, 13 million here, in both triumph on 106 million radios, radio but project by Stellan Collins. Also, they have a radio verse. Uh, Congress make like law because Congress, Congress Act uh, in made in 1912. It limits amateur radio operators standardized radio producers in crisis. It means we need a license to operate a radio. And WWI, Congress gives radio to Navy. Uh, because radio is an important, they know the radio is an important world, world tour. The US wants to control the global radio. So, <coughs> so the, the Congress acts give the formation of a monopoly.
and there was a golden age of radio. Uh, people across the America were sharing the stories and creating consensus based narratives. The golden age era shaped television program, programming future like sitcoms, anthology, drama, fictitious soaps and the Radio Pioneer's single sponsor program. Uh, 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 I, I forgot this, this part. There are cows that uh, make Congress Act in 1927. Radio <coughs> Congress did Regulate the radio at the prime broadcast. To, uh, also, to many stations and products, reception and uh, at creative conscience to monitor or airways public inter interest, convenience, or necessity. In 1934, they made Communication Act and Federal, Federal Communication Commission's Equality and today FCC covers television to run the internet. Uh, there, there is a radio format. Uh, radio has uh, AM and FM format. And they do niche, niche, niche marketing. Uh, their program is spe specialized for people. It's, it's like talk radio and format music, like top five, top four. It deals with the uh, record companies and it gives better and cheaper technology and portability and it gives efficient network alliances. And I will talk about the today radio station and culture today. And today the radio station most programming locally produced produced local DJs are the stars like Howard Stern, Rush Limbaugh, some national health has personalities. And secondary or background medium station. The radio station spe specialized stations with particular formats. Example, uh, news talk, other contemporary country things. And uh, most American is heaviest to his listeners during dry time. So it is like three hours in weekdays and six hours in weekend. Culture, there are both a variety of formats like news, news talks, other contemporary, as I mentioned, Hispanic urban country, rock, all these other. And <coughs> radio, radio goes digital, they have variety of formats like internet radio, like by Pandora and gives small and non-profit stations and pays mobile royalties and also satellite radio and the most famous thing is podcasting anybody can become a DJ like broadcasting jockey and it also efficient for free content and most mostly spoken word And that's all my presentation about radio.
and I will make some questions uh, the answer is on top of here Uh, number one, who initiated the first radio transmissions of the human voice? The answer is number two. And second question, the <coughs> original descendant. And the second one, I I didn't mention some the present presentation, but I found this question because it is useful. And the second, the first licensed commercial radio station debuted in 1920 in this city. And the answer is Pittsburgh. Um, third one, the first commercial aired on the radio was for this product. Uh, because of the real, est real estate, so radio aired on for real estate. Yes, yeah, so it's real estate. Movie M to the other button, the chip. Just put it
Hello, I'm Chong Lapche. Today, I'm here to tell you about movies. Let me begin the presentation with the introduction of the content, our cover. First, first, I will show you the history of movies, second, movies and culture. Is it okay? <coughs> third, third, issues and trends in feeling. First, the influence of new technology. <coughs> Is it okay? Is it okay? And fourth, the influence of new technology. And last, I will give you three tips about some important things. Did you see the movie Avatar? In 2009, many movie goers were amazed by the three-dimensional film avatar. Movie technology came here through rocky history. Let's understand the history of movies. <coughs> In 1891, the inventor Thomas Edison, together with William Gibson, came out with what they called the kinetoscope. The device that would become the predecessor to the motion picture projector, in which viewers could see in the kinetoscope captured events and performance. In 1895, Lumiere Brothers patented the cinematograph, that is, that is a lightweight film projector that also functioned as a camera and printer. By the close of the 19th century, technical innovation had been developed. It allows filmmakers like George Melius to experiment with special effects through a trip to the moon. That was the first SF movie. Trip to the Moon was one of the first films to incorporate fantasy elements and to use trip filming techniques both of which heavily influenced future filmmakers. The jazz singer in which the actor R. John Johnson improvised a few lines of synchronized dialogue and sang six songs. That was the first talkie, that means talking film. People could be enchanted and concentrated movie stories. In 1950, as a result of anti-church legislation, Technicolor was the monopoly on the color film industry. At the same time, Kodak came out with a multi-layer film stock that made it possible to use more affordable cameras and to produce a higher quality image. In 1940s, only 12% 12, 12 of pictures were in color. However, by 1954, more than 50% of movies were in color. The relationship between movies and culture involves a complicated dynamic. While thought and ideologies may be prevalent in a given era, American culture as 
diverse as the populations that form it. American feelings after World War I generally reflected the neutral. Bureau official cooperated were related related feelings. As a result, feelings tend toward toward the patriotic and were produced to inspire feelings of pride and confidence in America. Birth of Nation The film was an artistic achievement. In the early 20th century, fears about recent waves of immigrants had led to certain racist attitudes in mass culture. However, the outrage men, outrage men groups expressed about the film is a good reminder. Young generation growing increasing, increasingly dissatisfied with what they perceive to be the repressive social cause established by their more conservative. In the 1967 hit film, Bonnie and Clyde, an outlaw couple sets out on a uh, cross country and rotting spree. The youth culture's legal attitudes toward the top subject. MPAA opens a way for films to deal openly with mature content. Commercially less restrictive ratings are generally more beneficial. The day filmmakers created freedom in the content they were able to portray on screen. Movie success relies on access to mass distribution and marketing strategies to maximize the pro product reach and minimize competition. In this way, Hollywood has an enormous influence on the films to which the public has access. The blockbuster film, the blockbuster film became, becomes a touchstone not only for production values and storylines, but also for movie goals expectations. While the blockbuster drives the industry, the independent film reached the mainstream audience during the 1980s. Pulp Fiction, it was the first independent film to break $100 million at the box office, proving that there is still room in the market for movies produced outside of the big six studios. In 1975, a combined television set and video cassette recorder named VCR was too expensive for the average American home. However, developing technology in 1985, VCRs had found a place in nearly one third of U.S. households. Releasing films on DVD sim simultaneously with their theater release. Between 2005 and 2008, the number of direct to DVD release grew 36% as studios began to see the profitability of the strategy. However, Blu Blu-ray's risk technology and online digital downloads have brought about a decline in DVD sales. George Lucas's Star Wars Episode 2 
This is the first high definition digital video. This digital cinematography has become an increasingly attractive and increasingly popular. The digital format, which requires no printing or as the system developed over cable or satellite, these costs are virtually eliminated. New technologies have brought about a resurgence in the trend, and the contemporary 3D experience, experience seems less like a gimmick and more like a serious development in the industry. And for the resulting image, to come through clearly, the pair of red cameras must run in perfect sync with one another. Through the movie, through the movies, not only do audience turn out in great numbers for an experience they tend to reproduce at home, the theater are also able to charge more for tickets to see 3D films. Next, this time, picture this one. What is this? Did you see the the in 1891, the inventor Thomas Edison invented it. First, uh, the answer is A, the kinetoscope. Next. Okay. When is the period that <coughs> celebrated the emer emerging youth culture and rejection of the conservative of the previous decade? Do you remember Bonnie and Clyde? The poet. <laughs> the answer is B. Select independent movie. A. The Birth of Nation. B. Pop Fiction. C. Avatar. D. Trip to the Moon. The answer is B. Perk fiction. This is the end of my presentation. Thank you for your listening.
Okay, hi everybody. Um, let me know if you can hear me okay. I hope everybody's doing well this week. Um, hang on a second while I get everything set. There we go. Okay, so um, I'll continue on with um, with movies, and I will um, I'll try to work around a little bit the uh, um, material that that Jung. Um, gave us uh, during her presentation, so uh, play it by ear. Uh, I'll, I'll focus a bit more on the things that she didn't cover and a bit less on the things that she did. So. Okay, so um, it's important with, whoops, Sorry. Uh, it's important with um, all the forms of mass media that we look at to talk about technology without losing sight of the fact that um, technology isn't just about the development of science and scientific advancements and things like that, but uh, technology is also about um, the, the things that people who, who create technology are trying to achieve and also the things that people who use technology are trying to do. Um, sometimes uh, technologies uh, are presented to people and they do different things with them than are expected. So. Um, when we talk about technology, try, try not to think so much about technology as um, inevitable scientific progress, as it's often treated here um, in North America. Uh, try to think of uh, technology as um, the ways we understand things that people create and what they do with them. Um, okay. Um, I want to talk first about some of the precursors to film technology. Our chapter doesn't really cover this very much, and, and I think it's important. Um, so, I'll, But I'll just go over a few of them here. Um, one precursor is called magic lanterns. Um, magic lanterns were uh, entertainment devices that were, that, that, um, were developed uh, in the 17th century, basically the, the 1600s. And they were devices that um, were used uh, with, with light um, to, uh, to project shadow images for people's entertainment. Um, so long before photography, uh, people had already worked with um, projected images um, of of one kind or another. Um, so so keep in mind that there's a long history of um, a, a long history of attempts to entertain people uh, with projected images. Uh, still photography developed in in 1827 the first the first successful uh, still photo. Early photography was uh, produced on plates um, that were not uh, very uh, adaptable to um, motion picture technology. So um, not very practical for, for um, uh, motion pictures early on. The phonetoscope is a toy. It's a basically spinning spinning disks with pictures on them that were used 
to produce the illusion of moving images. Um, similar, uh, similar a couple of years later was the zoetrope, which is, um, I'm sorry, I don't have pictures of, of these, but um, the zoetrope is uh, similar to the phenocastic phena scope um, in that it's, uh, it's a, a device, a novelty that uses uh, pictures that one picture slightly different than the next. And then it's, uh, the, the, the pictures are put inside a large cylinder with slots between, uh, slots cut between each picture. And you can look in one of the slots and spin, spin the device around and you see pictures going by and um, it creates an illusion of motion. Now the, the illusion, um, the, the term that's used uh, for this illusion of motion is called persistence of vision. It's a very important um, site and of course I don't have it written in the slide so I'll write it, I'll write it in the chat box here. Persistence of vision. A uh, persistence of vision is the term that's applied um, to to the the psychological effect, human psychology, when we see very quickly images that are like one another but a little bit different. Um, we can our brains interpret that as a single image in motion. Uh, and that's very important for understanding how um, how film technology actually works and how it how it has an effect on people. Um, the first paper photo negatives, uh, as well as glass slides allowing uh, projection of still photos, were developed in 1839. Then there's something called an intermittent mechanism. Now this this wasn't initially developed in relation to um, communication. It was initially developed for things like using machines, like sewing machines. An intermittent mechanism is one that, uh, that will move in small increments and perform repetitive motions, moving something forward, 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 very, very slowly. Um, this was very, if, if any of you have ever used, uh, ever run a film projector, a film projector, the, even the film projectors we have today, they have teeth that uh, move the film together at a very specific speed. And the, um, these intermittent mechanisms were very important. Um, they work Quickly, they work very precisely, and they were very important in helping develop um, the mechanical, the moving parts that help move film at a speed necessary to uh, create this persistence of vision. Um, the last precursor, before we get to what the book gets, uh, gets to in detail, um, there's a man by the name of Edward Moybridge, and for for some years he he was carrying out a study. He was actually trying to uh, uh, trying to um, solve a bet, for, and I think it was for the governor of California. Um, he was studying horses and trying to prove that there's a moment when a horse is galloping, that there's a motion, that, that, that there's a moment in the horse's motion when all four feet are off the ground. And um, nobody could prove this without photography and without still photography. So what Moybridge did was he, he worked for years on this and he finally figured out he could set up a series of still cameras with trip wires so that as a horse ran by it would trigger each camera and the camera would each camera individually would take a photo and then the photos were strung together and made um, 
one of the very first motion motion uh, pictures, a uh, very famous motion test. And I have a copy of it here. I hope it will. I hope this will work. And you can see the lines going past in this image. This is not. This is a series of still images that are put together um, to form uh, to form persistence of vision, the the illusion of a moving picture. A uh, kinetoscope. Uh, this was invented in 1891. Now you'll remember, um, you'll remember from our previous lectures the name Thomas Edison. And I, I said previously, Thomas Edison is a very famous inventor. Um, he's actually more famous as an inventor than perhaps he should be he's he's actually he, i think i think he's he's most famous not because of things he actually invented but because he was a businessman who was uh who was looking to acquire patents he was very interested in inventions he did do inventing himself but he also did a lot of t um acquiring other people's inventions or uh having um hiring people to work on projects and put his name on those inventions and the kinetoscope is uh, the kinetoscope is is one of those inventions um, it, it it was mostly a, a, a result of the work of his assistant William Dixon uh, Edison uh, may have had something to do with it, but Dixon did most of the actual work on this one, and, and it's because Edison uh, hired him and paid him that Edison's name goes first um, in this uh, in uh, in discussion of this invention. Um, okay, so um, we already know a bit from uh, from the from the previous presentation about about what this invention is, the thing I want to point out here is the viewing context. Uh, take a look at the photo that's on the right hand side here. This is a <clears throat> this is a um, this is a salon for uh, viewing, and all these machines all these machines are um, kinetoscopes. Um, it, it was like a little hall where people could come and they'd put put a penny in the kinetoscope and watch a movie and each one might have a different movie. Um, perhaps some of you may have seen these. If you've ever been to San Francisco, um, a, a few years ago I was in San Francisco and I visited um, I visited a place that that had uh, active working series of kinetoscopes set up and I've seen different places where where these are set up as sort of novelty items they still they still work and they still show the same old um, motion pictures and the way this works it's not a strip of film but it's it's a it's a series of individual pictures that spin by very quickly as a person is looking through a um, through a lens a light shines on the photos and the photos spin by very quickly and sometimes they spin sometimes they're hand cranked and sometimes a machine cranks them and moves them but uh, it creates persistence of vision um, the kinetoscopes 
like a lot of very early film, uh, they were sort of novelty items. And so the things that were shown, uh, the, the things that people took pictures of, uh, uh, were, for instance, uh, a picture of a dog walking or a horse walking or a baby playing, very short, maybe one minute, maybe two minute um, uh, presentations. It was too, too early to call them films at this point, but even with early film, um, they weren't stories yet, generally. Um, the, the, this, these new media were, were novelties, and it was just, um, they were novelties that people were interested in just because they'd never seen anything like this before. Um, another thing is early film generally was considered mm, a lower class medium. It was a medium that appealed to people who couldn't afford to go to theater, couldn't afford to um, uh, pay to see live music, things like that. But, uh, the the new um, uh, the the arcade settings were uh, settings that, that working classes were were quite used to. The kinds of places where you would see initially see kinetoscopes set up were places like um, bars, arcades, um, circuses, uh, places that were considered. Uh, low culture, popular entertainment, entertainment for the masses, entertainment for people who didn't have a lot of money to spend, um, very much associated with, with the lower classes. Uh, 1895, uh, French, uh, French brothers, Auguste and Louis Lumiere, uh, created a lightweight projector um, with printer and camera all built in. Um, and they started showing, uh, showing films that they made with this device and they changed the setting. Now let me, let me emphasize here, if you look at the setup, look at the setup for the kinetoscope. The kinetoscope is an individual viewing device. One person watches at a time on each of these on each of these machines, it can be viewing in a group context, and often was. People would uh, the the people who were um, making kinetoscopes available uh, would have a one uh, one performance. Performance probably isn't right the right word because they're not really uh, they're not really stories, but. Uh, one set of images on each machine. It's very difficult to change the images in the machine. You basically, you set it up and the machine has one image on it and that's all it's going to have. So to keep people's attention, they had to have lots of alternatives for them. Somebody had to be able to go from one machine to the next machine to the next machine, watching each one minute series of, of pictures. Um, otherwise, they'd just get bored and go away. Uh, but he created uh, individual viewing in a group context as opposed to the Lumiere brothers device which allowed for projection of an image on a screen which allowed larger groups of people to watch all at once. Um, that's an important change when we start thinking about uh, mass communication Viewing context is very important. Um, we experience things differently when we see them as individuals than we do when we see them in a group setting with other people. Um, and so, so this is this is an important uh, important step. The Lumiere brothers had the very first commercial screening um, of films in December 1895. They showed uh, 10 short films that they had created. Um, and one of them, uh, one of them is 
uh, workers leaving the Lumiere factory, which I'll show you now. If I can figure out, I guess I have to stop that there. This one has music playing with it. Uh, there wasn't any music to go along with the original film. Uh, originally, the silent films that were developed in the early film era uh, had accompaniment. Somebody would play music along with it to keep people entertained. Uh, this wouldn't be so interesting just watching it without any music. Now you notice here, this is just people going around their daily business. It's quite literally, it's people leaving the factory at the end of the workday. And we see people walking by, we see what kind of clothes they're wearing, bicycles, there's a dog, a horse and carriage come through. So it's a very, very interesting artifact from the perspective <clears throat> of understanding the development of a new medium and how that medium might have affected people, why it was, why it was important. Um, it's also interesting just to see the different um, clothing that people are wearing and all of that, all of that sort of thing. So just to get, give you a, a sense of this new developing medium. The Vitascope. Uh, <laughs> you notice this poster here, uh, Edison's Greatest Marvel, the Vitascope. Uh, the Vitascope, again, Edison did not invent this. Uh, this is a motion picture pro projector, uh, first, <coughs> first demonstrated uh, uh, by Charles Francis Jenkins and Thomas Armat in 1895. Um, The, if, if, you, if you can imagine, around this time, there were a lot of people in various countries working independently. Um, a lot of people had the idea to create motion pictures and somehow to do it uh, with the various, the various kinds of technologies that had been developed at that point. And what was, what was happening was Lots of people kind of uh, trying to start starting their own small businesses and trying to trying to develop the technology that would be dominant. Um, Thomas Edison was uh, one of the primary people doing this, and he was so he was buying up inventions where he could, where he thought they would make sense. He bought up uh, the rights to this vitascope and began exhibitions around the U.S. Now the other important thing, um, when you look at this photo, again, this emphasizes this, this emphasizes that it's not what's being shown on if if you if you go to a movie theater now and you see the advertisements outside, the advertisements are all about what's the movie. What's the content of the movie? You notice this poster, it has nothing to do with the content of the movie. It says Edison's greatest marvel, the vitascope. <coughs> so at this point, at this point in film history, um, film is a novelty. It's so new that many people just want to see it and regardless of, of what's being shown to them. Right? So this, this um, has a lot to do also with the kind of content that's available on early films. Okay, we heard a little bit about George Méliès' trick films. Um, Méliès was a French magi magician 
uh, actually a magician. And um, he was the first person to use the technique of camera editing to create illusions uh, on film. So, uh, very, very interesting. Um, let me show, and he started like, like, uh, like the people who um, came before him in early film. He began by, um, without any stories, without any particular storyline, but, but at a certain point, he did start using his illusions to tell stories. Now, let's see. This one is The Vanishing Lady. Now he's using, um, this 1896, and he's using, he's using editing techniques to create illusions, similar to the illusions he would create as a magician. Again, this music is added on later. Uh, this is not part of the original film. Considering that now you can, I, I, I've seen kids doing this kind of stuff with VCRs and, and um, video cameras, but if you consider how early in the technology this is, and if you consider nobody had done this before, it, it's quite impressive what, uh, what Melgues did at this point. Now let's go. I'll show you just a bit of trip to the moon, which is it's a it's a much longer, uh, much longer film. I I recommend you take a look at it online. It's very whoops, wrong one. It's very easy to find it. Here we go, trip to the moon. Or maybe it doesn't like us. I'll try one more time, see if I'm doing something wrong. It might just be that it's a bigger file. Um, Okay, well, I'll talk for a minute, and if it doesn't start playing, then I'll assume that the upload didn't work, and then I'll recommend that uh, you, you find it online and take a look at it. But um, <clears throat> Trip to the Moon is uh, one of the very early narrative films, um, and it, oh, no, it's, 
it's not YouTube, Ken. It's, uh, well, actually, they're all YouTube videos, but it's not a YouTube. Um, okay, try to untalk. All right, I'll. Okay, um, I think it's taking uh, taking a while. So if Ken if Ken gets it and it works, great. We'll pause and and watch it. But otherwise, um, an interesting thing about this film uh, is the combination of uses of um, very kind of very interesting uses of of. Um, constructed sets and makeup. There's a, a very famous um, uh, picture. Okay, embed code. All right.
I don't know, Ken. It's probably just me. Uh, anyhow, um, Trip to the Moon is uh, very well known in, in the United States and in many other countries as well. Um, and I, I recommend that you, you take a look for it when you have a chance. Nickelodeon craze. Um, Nickelodeon uh, refers to small exhibition places for viewing films. Uh, these were often in, in storefronts. Like, um, yeah, like the uh, kinetoscope, um, they were seen as a cheaper uh, alternative to live theater. Uh, unlike the kinetoscope, this was also, this was group viewing um, in, the, in Nickelodeon's. Uh, they were named Nickelodeons because the, oftentimes the ad admission fee was uh, five cents. Um, a fa very famous film mentioned in the book is a short uh, called The Great Train Robbery uh, by Edwin Porter. I'll show you, I'll try to show you a little bit of that one. We'll see if that works. something else. techniques to tell stories. Early motion pictures. Now, there was developed a motion picture industry. Now, initially, as with, as with radio, initially um, motion pictures were, um, it, was chaotic, it was a chaotic scene, lots of different people uh, working on their own projects, 
bringing together different existing technologies, trying to figure out how to make films work, um, trying to figure out how to make money doing it because they had to support themselves. Um, uh, some people were just trying to do a, a relatively small project. Other people, like Edison, had a big picture in mind. Edison, when he was involved with film and with all his inventions, Edison was the kind of person who was looking forward, um, trying to project ahead uh, the development of an entire industry and how he would be the central person in that industry, the person to make make the money in that industry. Now, um, so the 10 largest companies that were involved in uh, film at this time banded together and they created something, uh, a, a trade group called the Motion Picture Patents Company, MPPC. Now what they wanted to do is standardize uh, standardized film produ pr production and at the same time to, to develop contracts so that people who weren't part of this group wouldn't have access to key technologies. Uh, for example, the MPPC uh, tried, to, tried to have an exclusive contract with Eastman Kodak. Eastman Kodak developed um, the key uh, photographic technology that was uh, essential to so many of these film pro projects. And the MPPC um, put together, uh, uh, tried to put together a deal with Kodak that would make it so that nobody who wasn't part of their group would have access to this technology. Um, Ultimately, that resulted in some what are called antitrust actions uh, in in the United States, uh, as in many other countries. There are, uh, there were, and to some extent, still are, uh, still are laws that uh, prevent try to prevent people from. Oh, people couldn't hear me talking over the music. Well, never mind. <laughs> okay. Uh, um, Uh, there were laws to prevent uh, what's called restraint of trade, where somebody gets into a market and starts making deals to prevent other people from operating in that marketplace. Uh, it's illegal because it's bad for consumers and it allows people to monopolize, to uh, offer things at high prices or uh, somehow in other ways to, to inhibit uh, inhibit competition and do things that are bad for consumers. So um, when they did this, when the MPPC tried to uh, tried to create this uh, exclusive contract Kodak, they undermined themselves because then there were some antitrust actions that that uh, basically did them in. Another thing that undermined the MPPC, um, they, they created some very strict rules about how films had to be shown. And one of the rules had to do with showing films one reel at a time. Now a reel of film, for those of you who are familiar with reels of film, and it now occurs to me that some of you may never have seen these things, but <clears throat> film film gets wrapped around a spool and the spools come in varying sizes. I'm not sure exactly what size they were using at this at, at, at the time that we're talking about. But uh, the spool would be like this. The film would be maybe three, less than half an inch wide. Um, and uh,
by having multiple reels. Now, I'm not sure how they did it exactly in this era, but, but um, I've worked with projectors before um, in, uh, in projection facilities with multi-reel films. And essentially, what happened there, <coughs> excuse me, you would have two projectors side by side, one with the first reel, one with the second reel. You would play the first reel, and you would know where the first reel was going to end, and that would give you a signal of when to start the second reel, so that when the first reel ran out, the second reel would start, and it allowed you to show the film uh, with continuity between the two reels, so that it created um, an illusion of a continuing story. Um, the longer films allowed for more sophisticated storytelling, um, more complex stories. Um, uh, people were willing to pay higher prices for tickets uh, because, because the longer stories seemed more significant, more important than the short ones. Um, it increased the res respectability of film for the, upper, the middle and upper classes because instead of just showing very short, simple stories, they could show more complex stories, they could show uh, uh, the, the people, started, people started adapting theater uh, to film. Um, and it, it, it appealed to people who, uh, until that point, had avoided film as a medium. Uh, so the MP, uh, um, MPPC really, they, they undermined themselves because they, they uh, created very restrictive rules for their members and one of the rules prohibited them showing these multi-reel films. They had to show only single reel films, one at a time. Um, so that, that worked against them. Uh, the feature films, the new feature films also helped usher in what we call the star system. Um, essentially, people going to movies, when they started watching these feature films, uh, the longer films started uh, really giving, letting good actors become more well known and more recognizable in films. And uh, uh, film, film viewers started to recognize particular people, particular stars. Um, and uh, they would go to the films that were that that had those people in them. <coughs> people producing films began to recognize this. They began to make um, they began to make uh, contracts with particular actors and make films around those actors. Make films especially for those actors. <coughs> and that um, that. Um, was really the beginning of what we call the star system in the United States. Now, Hollywood. <laughs> Why do we have a film industry in Hollywood? Uh, early film industries were actually operating more on the East Coast, um, New York, New Jersey, uh, Edison was from New Jersey, I think. Um, uh, there were some around Chicago. Um, they were basically uh, operating um, in uh, industrial areas. The problem was um, the early film industry, the, the, the cameras required very strong lighting. And so <coughs> if you were going to make a film and the, usually, for all practical purposes, the early film industry, to make a good film, you needed good, um, <coughs> excuse me, good outdoor lighting, lots of sunshine. And sunshine is not reliable much of the year on the East Coast in the United States, um, and certainly not in Chicago. Excuse me, please.
My five-year-old came home with a cold the other day, and now I've caught it. Okay. So uh, part of the move to Hollywood, or the, the development of Hollywood, was the practical purpose of, if, in, order to, in order to develop a thriving industry, um, people producing films had to have a constant supply. Um, there weren't very many films around to be shown in the early era. They were, uh, people were simultaneously developing the technology to show films and also trying to produce films themselves. Um, <clears throat> so Hollywood was really great for year-round production of films. It's sunny year-round, um, which provides good lighting. Uh, it's close, in close proximity to oceans, to deserts, um, to green areas, uh, to mountains, um, all kinds of different scenes. Uh, it's close to uh, cities, cheap land. I, I'm saying is, was, <laughs> used to be. Uh, there's no cheap land there now. Um, and it created an opportunity for the innovators, I don't want to say inventors, because they weren't all inventors, but the innovators, the people who were trying to create something new, new industry, um, it, it allowed them really to be a bit liberated from existing industries by moving away to their own space. Um, they weren't so much under the control of uh, other uh, people from other industries. So it really, uh, it, there's a, there are very significant reasons that Hollywood uh, became the center of, of uh, film production in the United States. <clears throat> um, one thing that's common with most new communication media is that somehow or other um, there's some cultural stresses, social concerns that come up in relation to the medium. It happens with uh, it, hap it happens with with pretty much every every medium. Um, early film um, now. I, I haven't mentioned this, our book doesn't mention it, but uh, one example, uh, the, the content matter of early film, mostly pre-narrative, but not entirely pre-narrative, a lot of it is, um, was produced for titillation, for excitement. Um, you could see, um, um, short films of a, a, a woman in a bathing suit, which was pretty radical in in that era. Um, uh, the some of the earlier films that were uh, that were narrative films that were produced were, for example, uh, stories uh, based on. Uh, they may be classical stories, but they're classical stories that involve. Um, Wives cheating on husbands, or things like that, that are that are um, not really socially. They were not really socially acceptable in the United States, and the content the content matter was something that drew people in for the excitement of seeing it. Um, and it remains that way today, of course. A lot of a lot of films people go to see. They go see. Um, because they're exciting, they're titillating. And this um, has created some social concern and government discussion as people, um, people raise their concerns with government. So um, the film industry in 1922 um, formed because of, because of the gr uh, growing social concern over the moral influence of films and also over over what was perceived as immoral behavior by 
um, people in the film industry, people getting reputations for having uh, parties and conducting themselves in ways that uh, we don't uh, that that weren't socially acceptable. So uh, the Motion Picture Producers and Distributors of America, which was uh, was formed in 1922, uh, later named the Motion Picture Association of America. This was um, an, an industry group that was uh, a way for the industry to, to self-regulate, to, to, to create rules for itself so that government wouldn't step in and regulate the industry for it. Um, one of the early things that they did was create what's called the Hollywood Production Code. Sometimes this is called the Hayes Code. I'll go into it in more detail in a moment. Um, but this was a, a code which um, the film industry was supposed to abide by uh, in order to ensure that they weren't um, having a negative impact on the mor morals of people in society. Uh, later on, they shifted to a ratings system, 1968. Um, I'll go into that also in a, in a moment. Uh, let me talk a bit about the Hayes Code. Um, the Hayes Code is actually really interesting. It has a whole long list of things you can and can't do in in film uh, uh, and and it 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 was quite restrictive uh, it's it was developed in 1930 it wasn't really enforced until about 1934 and the enforcement <clears throat> kind of coincided with um, the end of prohibition uh, on alcohol in, in the United States. Um, okay, the general principles, uh, the general principles of this code, no picture shall be produced that will lower the moral standards of those who see it. Hence, the sympathy of the audience should never be thrown to the side of crime, wrongdoing, evil, or sin. Okay, so this was the industry's way. They, they were, people at this point, They'd already figured out people like to see movies that involve people behaving badly. They involve sex, they involve crime, they involve uh, drinking, drugs, uh, all, those, all those sorts of things. So they, the Hollywood movie industry knew that people liked those kinds of films. So they created a code that allowed them still to produce movies that showed people involved in criminal behavior. But the catch was the end of the movie, the conclusion of the movie had to always have that the person that was involved in bad behavior getting punished in some way. The ultimate message should be this message that 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 immoral behavior is not acceptable, and that uh, immoral behavior leads to bad consequences for the person who's engaged in that behavior. Uh, okay, um, correct standards of life, subject only to the requirements of of uh, drama and entertainment, shall be presented. Right? In other words. Uh, we should maintain high moral values where, where we have characters who don't maintain high moral values. We need to show in our film, we need to show that we disapprove of those ultimately. Um, and law, natural or human, shall not be ridiculed, nor shall sympathy be created for its violation. Uh, that's uh, from, my, from my perspective, uh, uh, a very twisted sort of way, but it, it basically it basically is saying um, that there are certain 
fundamental moral values and the film industry should never produce films that uh, that go against those fundamental moral values. Now, if you go deeper into the code, you read into it, um, the code actually mentions there's a prohibition on what's called miscegenation, which means mixing of the races. Uh, so there was a prohibition there. This is now quite outmoded, but, but there was an explicit prohibition in there that would prohibit um, depiction of, of relationships between things like that. So uh, other things that, that the code addresses are things like uh, drug use, um, murder specifically, uh, crime in general. Um, so uh, there was a, a whole list of things in this code that, um, that film industries were restricted from, from doing. Um, <clears throat> Over time, as society changed, now the, the, this code was in, in force still until the early 1960s, um, but followed less and less, even though every once in a while there was conflict with government uh, and threat of regulation. Um, ultimately, what the industry did was um, in 1968, um, they replaced the Hollywood production code with a ratings system. And this is the rating system which is familiar to um, people in this part of the world. Um, sets ratings, uh, G is a general audience movie and that means anybody any age should be able to go and see it. Uh, PG is parental guidance. Um, it means you could take your children to see it if you want to. We don't necessarily recommend it. Uh, the, the code has gotten, uh, in recent years, the code has started giving, given, giving more specific information about why, why a rating is, is provided. And this is particularly true on uh, DVDs. I haven't seen it as much with motion pictures, but on DVDs oftentimes um, <clears throat> they'll be explicit about um, exactly why um, exactly why a rating um, is given on a particular film. So the key ratings rating levels are uh, G, PG. Uh, R is restricted, which means under a certain age, is uh, uh, people are not allowed to see it. Um, in recent years, this has become more more nuanced. So, for instance, um, there may be uh, some films restricted to restricted from to anyone under the age of 14. Other ones, anyone under the age of 17 or 18. Um, there's another rating, uh, X rating. Uh, that was actually that's actually not um, uh, not part of this ratings system uh, of the Hollywood industries. Uh, that was actually um, a publicity stunt by um, <clears throat> uh, by people who were producing uh, pornographic films, and that was a way for them actually to in a way to to market their films to set them. Uh, uh, to, to show people what kind of films they were they were creating, uh, so that's that's not part of the same ratings system, even though it's something that um, people are familiar with and often confused with the, the Hollywood ratings system. <clears throat> Technological advances we heard about. Uh, 1925 and the production of sound in in the jazz singer. This is um, this poster from the jazz singer. This is uh, Al Jolson. Uh, they don't show him. Well, oh, never mind. Um, uh, Al Jolson um, was 
a very famous, at this time, very famous singer. And uh, Warner Brothers uh, was, had, had purchased a, um, had, had purchased a technology for sound, which um, they, they weren't, they weren't actually planning to use it to change the way that film was delivered. This technology, they were actually, um, now early, early films were oftentimes shown in a setting, they'd be in a theater and there'd be a place in the theater, an orchestra, what they called an orchestra pit. And this would be down in front of the stage um, when you would have you'd have the stage where the performance would be and then lower than the stage so that they wouldn't be in the way would be place for an orchestra to sit and play music and they could see the screen and uh, play music to go along to go along with a film now many exhibition halls had this um, had these orchestra pits some didn't and uh, Warner bought this technology uh, not because they were going to change the way that films were produced, but because they were planning on uh, providing it to uh, exhibition halls that didn't have facilities for live music to be played in order to give a better, uh, a better viewing experience, um, entertain people by having music recorded music play along with a movie rather than live music. Um, turned out though, <clears throat> when they produced this film, The Jazz Singer, Al Jolson, uh, he did, had a few impromptu improvised lines. They weren't even scripted lines that he said in, in the film. And he sang a few songs during the film. And people loved it. Uh, the audience really loved it. They loved hearing, uh, hearing the actor. It made it made the experience come alive for them. And so, by mistake, and again, this is an example of uh, what happens when technology is received in a way other than expected. Uh, the audience didn't respond in quite the way that Warner Brothers expected them to. They responded differently and that changed the entire face of the industry. Um, there's actually <clears throat> actually a, a, a musical called Singing in the Rain that's all about this transition of the early film industry from uh, from the silent era to the sound era and if if you want to if you want to get a sense of what that transition may have been like, it's a very good film to watch um, for uh, for its commentary on changes in the film industry around this time. Another techno technological advance is uh, called Technicolor. <coughs> um, uh, films, film, filmmakers experienced, uh, experimented with various kinds of processes for coloring film. Anything from hand painting, hand, hand tinting to uh, chemical tinting of, of film. Uh, nothing was really that satisfactory. They did, some, most people didn't bother, most people just did black and white. But there were some some people who were doing color before this. But the Technicolor three color process is the also um, manageable from a production perspective. And two films, two uh, Disney uh, animated films were the first ones to do this a little bit earlier in the 1930s. But the first, um, the first 
live action films to use this process were The Wizard of Oz and Gone with the Wind. And I posted a I posted a few photos there from 1939. I posted a few photos here from The Wizard of Oz so you can see just how much color is used uh, in that film. Uh, it, it was a film that that built color into the narrative and imbued it with with meaning and and uh, uh, it's 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 impossible now for us to really fully understand it I think how how big a shift that was and how important it was um, another technological advance this is um, Um, and uh, started in 1953, uh, there was developed what's called an, an, an anamorphic lens. It's basically a, a that has the effect of stretching, stretching Im image um, without requiring a, a wider, uh, a wider film strip. So, uh, and it was a company, there was a, a camera that was shooting a film and another set of lenses for the projector that was showing the film. Um, this is an innovation that came up. You notice the date, the 1953. This is an innovation that was heavily promoted uh, because this was a time that the Hollywood film industry was starting to feel pressure from television. Um, television, uh, television started in the early 1940s and really developed, uh, really developed in in the late 1940s and, and early 1950s, and was a sudden uh, a shock uh, competition for the film industry. Um, you notice this picture I have here, <clears throat> the upper one. Uh, shows one of the major theaters, it's a Paramount Theater, <coughs> and they're advertising CinemaScope, which is one of the proprietary widescreen processes that, that was used to produce widescreen film. And the film that's showing at this particular theater is Prince Valiant. So um, even as late as the 1950s, um, <coughs> the technology the innovation of the technology was very important as a mark of something that could be um, promoted separate from the film and sometimes above the film. You notice how uh, CinemaScope is much the, 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 the film. And below, I posted a photo. This is from I think the I think the film is Red River, <laughs> um, and just some of the use of CinemaScope. Um, you can see uh, what what uh, what the film industry was trying to do was to create an experience for the audience that would have the effect of surrounding them uh, surrounding them with the with the picture. Uh, the uh, already at this point, even with uh, even with standard films, the film industries were experimenting with slightly curved screens. But the screen for a CinemaScope uh, production would have a significant curve to it, so that if you sat toward the front, you'd actually have the uh, have the feeling that that the that the picture was surrounding you. You could be you could be sitting in front of the screen, and have the edges of the screen actually behind you while you were sitting in the theater if you sat in the right place. So what what Hollywood was trying to do with this was to um, give people the sense of being 
part of the picture, being surrounded by the picture, um, and trying to create uh, trying to create a sense that couldn't be reproduced by television. That was key to this particular technology, is that, that competition with television. Um, studio system. As the film industry developed, there was there were five major studios that were producing about, I believe at, at this point, about 85% of the films uh, that people were seeing, at least 85% of the viewership. There were five major studios, Warner Brothers, Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, RKO, 20th Century Fox, and Paramount. The way the industry worked was something called vertical in integration. <clears throat> what that meant was each studio, each studio company owned its own production facilities and it had exclusive contracts with people involved in production. That meant uh, actors, directors, camera people, any kind of people involved in the process of producing films would be under exclusive contract. If you worked for one studio, you weren't allowed to work for another studio. Um, this included writers as well. Um, and the various studios um, developed and, and people knew about the, the, the different styles. So for example, uh, Warner Brothers in um, the 19, 1930s, 1940s, 1950s, Warner Brothers was known for a combination of comedies, like the Marx, the Marx Brothers, if any of you know who they are, um, but also uh, what we call social problem films. They did a lot of dramas about crime and um, uh, gangs and things like that. So they were very well known for these kinds of stories. Um, <clears throat> Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer was known for uh, big flashy productions. Uh, Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer is the studio that, that produced um, The Wizard of Oz, sorry, just had a brain cramp, uh, which was which which I showed you the photos of a couple of minutes ago. Big, flashy, flashy production. Um, each studio was uh, was associated with a particular style of filmmaking. Um, viewers were aware of who the who the stars were that were for particular uh, particular studios, that sort of thing. Uh, each studio also had its own distribution network, which meant uh, they owned the smaller companies that would take films and distribute them around the country. And each studio either owned or had exclusive contracts for exhibition. In other words, movie theaters would exclusively show movies by a particular studio. You notice in that picture that I showed you about widescreen, CinemaScope. You notice this is the Paramount Theater. Paramount. Paramount is one of the five major studios. Uh, 20th Century Fox had its own theaters. Warner had its own. And you can still go to cities um, <clears throat> you can still go to cities in the United States and see old theaters and they still have, many of them still have the name of these companies, the Warner Theater. Um, uh, I did a, I, I, uh, yeah, I, I did a concert, um, publicity for a concert that, that was uh, held at the Warner Theater in uh, Los Angeles, I think it was. Um, so all of these, now uh, the old theaters are disappearing now, but it, it wasn't 
that long ago that you could still, even after the studio system was broken up, you could still go and see all these different exhibition halls that had the names of the different studios on them. So this was a very controlled system. Every studio had its group of artists and technicians that would produce films. They had their own distribution network and they had their own exhibition network and there was no way to get around that. They controlled, that meant, that meant they controlled most of the film making and film viewing across the United States and to some extent in Canada as well. Um, in 1948, and this is, this is actually a very important date uh, because uh, uh, it's, this is also related to the coming of television. There's a very important court case called U.S. versus Paramount, uh, Paramount Pictures. And in this court case, the United States government, uh, the, the court decision ordered that, ordered that the five major studios had to break up this vertical integration. In other words, they had to make a decision. Did they want to be producing films? Did they want to be distributing them? Did they want to be exhibiting them? And they could not have exclusive arrangements one to another. In other words, if somebody ran a movie theater, that movie theater had to be accessible to films produced by many different companies. You couldn't have an exclusive arrangement that said only one company can show films in this theater. <clears throat> this was the importance for television in this case. Um, this was a time that television was just emerging in the United States. Um, it had been seen as an up-and-coming technology. People knew it was going to be, it was new, it was exciting, it was going to change things. And it was clear that the Hollywood studios were going to resist. They saw this as competition. And so this decision that helped break, that broke up the monopoly of the studio system weakened Hollywood so that they would have to, prov uh, so that uh, so that they wouldn't have such strength in resisting uh, in resisting television and the development of television industry. <clears throat> now this is a, a I like this this chart showing the popularity of cinema. All right, uh, it doesn't. Let's see. It's a little hard to read here, but as I recall, this one starts in the 1930s, around 1930. <clears throat> um, this is the era of the Great Depression in the United States. So if you take a look here, um, this is percentage of people who the percentage of people in the United States who on average were going to cinema once a week. Um, and if you look here, 60, about 65 percent of the population of the United States in 1930 were going to the movies once a week, at least. There's a sudden drop off here that coincides with the Depression. People didn't have so as much as many resources to spend. Um, picks up a little bit now. This this is the era. This um, I don't know if you can see my pointer here, but um, so between between about 1930 and about 19 into the 1940s, then we pick up again. And then there's another drop off coinciding with World War II 
and drop, drop, drop. Ah, could use drawing tools. Okay, well, I'll figure out how to do that for next time. I can just do this orally, but thanks, Ken. Um, so in any case, what's important here is you see there's a major drop-off, and a lot of this drop-off is attributed <clears throat> Um, some of the, drop, the early drop-off in the 1930s is an economic drop-off um, that picks up again. But after that, the drop-off is pretty consistent with fewer and fewer people going to the movies at least once a week. <clears throat> and that's about television. That's about people <clears throat> getting access to a technology that allows them to reproduce, at least to their satisfaction, in their own homes, the same effect that they can have when they go to the movie theaters. Uh, that's the threat to, uh, to cinema that's, uh, that's posed by television. Okay, some major changes. These are all important things to, to know about. Um, Books have been written on all of these things, so we can't go into we can't go into lots of detail. But um, so the rise of television, beginning part uh, particularly in the 1950s, uh, has been a threat not just to the st to studios and the studio system, but also a, a threat to the dominance of um, cinema as a as an entertainment media. Um, Another thing, the House on American Activities Committee. Um, the House on American Activities Committee was uh, a committee that developed, it was operating, I think they started operating in the late 1940s. They were particularly prominent in the 1950s. Um, if you've heard of the McCarthy era <clears throat> in the United States, Senator Joseph McCarthy was um, the person most closely associated with this committee of Congress that was trying to ferret out communist sympathizers in many different uh, industries in the United States, particularly entertainment industries, and they were actively they were actively going after people in the film industries, um, also television, radio. Um, entertainment industries generally were highly, highly suspect. And uh, this was something that put quite a bit of pressure on, uh, on all those industries, including uh, the film industry uh, in that era. Um, it had a big impact on the kind of stories that were told. Uh, it had a big impact on um, who was able to work in those industries. There was something called the blacklist, uh, a basically list of people who could not be employed um, in, uh, a, in the film industry, your television or entertainment industries, uh, because they had been uh, identified by the House on american Activities Committee as, as uh, communist sympathizers. <clears throat> um, culture changes over time, and one of the thing now this our chapter our chapter goes mentions many different films, and uh, I thought about how to how to manage this because it it, it mentions many different films without telling us why they're important uh, in in any great detail. And I was left with the choice of either, either going into that great detail or just making sort of general statements. And I, I opted for the second because we, we can't really go into so much, so much detail. But um, culture changes over time and film changes along with it. The book sort of, our book makes an argument that Movies affect culture, and culture affects movies. Uh, I think that's a non-controversial, a fairly obvious point to make. Um, 
the 1960s and the 1970s were a very big change culturally in the United States. Um, there was a youth movement, uh, development of uh, feminism in the United States, uh, changing, uh, changing morals on many, many different aspects of life, uh, changes in all kinds of all kinds of industries and all kinds of all kinds of entertainment. Um, and that, that had a huge impact on on uh, cinema. In the 1970s and 1980s, um, blockbuster films dominated uh, Jaws, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Uh, the film industries at this point were focused on uh, developing big hits that would bring in lots of profit. Um, some other things that have affected the industry, the development of VCR and uh, VCR uh, created new competition because it, it pulled people away from <clears throat> Uh, again, away from viewing things in the cinema, but it also created new markets because people who had VCRs wanted to watch Hollywood films, and so the film industry got new revenue from from the development of, of VCR and later DVDs, um, even even though uh, those technologies continued the trend of pulling people out of the cinema and into private homes to watch films. And the 1990s, the development of special effects, uh, blockbusters built on special effects. <clears throat> okay. The rise of television is very important for um, film industry. The rise of television meant uh, competition for programming. Um, and actually, the the um, there was a case in I think it was also 1948, 1949, um, a case that <clears throat> required basically it required the uh, film industry to uh, to not to give away but to sell access to um, uh, Hollywood films, older Hollywood films, uh, to the developing television industries, so that they could so that they could show them. And um, again, uh, uh, this was uh, Hollywood was trying to resist the development of the new medium uh, by not not turning not uh, not selling them access to Hollywood films uh, as, a, as a way to uh, have leverage over audiences and keep audiences coming back to cinema. But after the decision that, that uh, required that they give, I'm sorry, that they sell access to films uh, to the television industry, it became a huge source of revenue for them. So they didn't exactly lose. Uh, in the deal. But there was competition for viewers. Uh, another thing, <clears throat> television. Um, cinema developed during an era in which the United States was becoming much more urban. And I'll, I'll go into that. I think that's perhaps in the next slide. Um, television is a suburban in, uh, the, the rise of television is associated with, with the development of suburbia in the United States. And it's a very good suburban medium, um, precisely because you know, de development of the suburbs is development of uh, private family homes that are still relatively close to other families. People could entertain in their own homes, in either have their own families in their homes or invite neighbors or friends over and entertain with this new medium, with the television. To give you a sense of the growth of TV, in 1950, 
Nine percent of homes in the United States had a television. In 1955, 64 and a half percent of the homes in the United States had a television. 1960, it's up to 87 percent. 1965, 92 percent of the homes in the United States have a television. This is at least one television, right? This is enormous, enormous growth for this new medium, this, this medium that's competing with the film industries. The average daily viewing, household daily viewing time goes from 1940 to 1950. It's under four and a half hours a day. We get to 2008, 2009, more than eight hours a day the average household daily viewing time. So people are watching more television at the same time that they're going to the movies less often. Right. Now this was my, my slide, culture shapes movies, movies shape culture. Um, I've just put some posters of uh, uh, pictures from, from what we call social issues films. Um, I am a fugitive from a chain gang. This was one of those Warner Brothers uh, social issues films that deal with uh, crime. Um, women's prison, I'm not sure who produced this one. Uh, there, were, there were some films that weren't necessarily out of the big studios that were um, uh, trying to be titillating uh, the women's prison movies. Uh, was there was a whole genre of women's prison movies that that uh, were uh, notorious in a certain era of the film uh, film industry. Uh, this photo here is from a movie called Cool Hand Luke with uh, Paul Newman. Uh, this was an important movie um, during the the 1960s. It was a, a movie that showed uh, a prisoner. Uh, working uh, on one of these chain gangs that's mentioned in in the Paul Mooney film, uh, but he's he's a rebel and he's uh, trying to fight the system. Fighting the system was very common a common theme in the 1960s and 1970s. This is a photo from the the lower right hand corner, a photo from the movie Norma Ray, which is about uh, it's actually based on a true story. Um, but it's a, it's a movie about um, a woman who uh, fights to establish a, a, a um, union in a southern textile plant. Okay. Point here for me is movies are part of culture. Culture is part of movies. Culture is diverse. There are any number of different views that someone can find in, in movies. It's very difficult to generalize about movies. You can, and some people have done very usefully, looking at specific movies, specific directors, and um, uh, examined the messages of their films. And, uh, but it's beyond the scope of what we're able to do um, in the short amount of time that we have in front of us. Okay, this I was talking about before. From the 1890s to the 1920s, the U.S. is shifting from a rural to an urban society. More people moving out of farmland, out of agricultural work, and moving to cities. Uh, mass media developing. Uh, we're developing advertising, radio, film. Those mass media are giving us images who we, of who we are, and who we should be. That changes over time. And I chose the two photos here. Uh, one of them is a movie called The Green Berets with John Wayne. It was produced in the 1960s, set in the Vietnam War, which was going on at that time. And it was very, uh, very patriotic, very pro-war. And below that, I posted a, a still from the movie Apocalypse Now, which came out in 1979, um, 
some years after the end of the Vietnam War, which the United States lost um, and has a very different, uh, much more critical message about, uh, about the war. Um, culture is increasingly, when we talk about mass culture, we're talking about a culture that's increasingly absorbed, increasingly reflected through media or as they're otherwise known, cultural industries. <clears throat> um, just as American culture is not monolithic, so film presents varied images of US culture. Um, we don't have a simple monolithic picture of culture coming through film. Some continuing issues. Uh, the importance of marketing and publicity. Uh, films that are successful tend to be films that have been marketed well. And this is the major film studios now uh, are conglomerates and where they succeed at producing films, they're films usually that are very well marketed. There's also been the growth of what we call product placement and advertising promotions. I posted a couple of photos here from one of the early prominent films to do this, which was E.T. Uh, E.T. built into its narrative um, a candy called Reese's Pieces. Um, and uh, a character in this uses Reese's Pieces as things to uh, lure the alien in the movie into into the house and to get the alien to do things. Uh, Reese's Pieces had a deal with the film, uh, and I, I don't know who produced this film, but they had a, an advertising deal that allowed them to sell candy with a picture of E.T. on it. This is very common, this sort of thing now. These deals are an essential uh, uh, and very, very lucrative uh, source of revenue for film industries as well as for the people they work with. We have blockbusters, we have independents, we have foreign films. Okay. Um, I won't go further into that because it was already covered well enough. There are now six major studios, Warner Brothers, Paramount, 20th Century Fox, Universal Columbia, and Disney. Um, the names of the studios have been around for years and years. The studios are different now. They're, they're major conglomerates. Uh, they're international conglomerates now. They're no longer simply Hollywood industry. Oop, yep, running out of time. Ooh, yep, okay. Yeah, so and I believe these were covered well enough. So uh, I hope that this is all clear enough. I see we have gone a couple of minutes over. So I thank you all for your attention. If you have questions, please feel free to email me or, or, to, or to post them as always in the channel as we go. Um, and I look forward to seeing you next week. Um, next week, I believe we have two chapters to cover in order to catch up for one that we missed last week. So um, have a good week. Ken, anything else?